All right, we're recording. And you've got your microphone turned on and everything? It's turned on now, yeah. So it's turned on the device and the amplifier? Yes. Cool. It shows it's recording. So it's recording. And, but the little, the thing in between? That's the one? Um, yes. Okay, cool. That's one. Sometimes gets me back. Um, okay, welcome. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, as, as was kind of mentioned, uh, my name is Gary Rogers. Um, I'm the director of technology at uh, Rain Agency. We're in American Fork. We're uh, kind of where a software consulting company meets a traditional ad agency. Um, something in between there. We do a lot of um, web-based projects, mobile projects, um, a lot of custom software development for all sorts of companies. Um, you can check out our website, it's meetrain.com if you want to see more, but I um, won't focus too much on that. Um, today's session is going to be on multi-platform JavaScript debugging, so hopefully that's the one you intended to come to. And you can find me on Twitter, my Twitter handle is at carbohydrate. Um, so uh, mobile web programming is a bit of a mess. Okay. How many of you have So yeah, it's it's kind of a wild west right now. There's so much going on. There's so much uh, being contributed. So many devices coming out. So many um, options with um, data connectivity and mobility that it's just it's going 50 million directions, 100 miles an hour. Um, and uh, you know, I think there's a bright future in a lot of areas, but there's just so much happening and people trying to get attention and things out there that. Um, so, so I want to take um, a minute and go on a bit of a tangent on, because of this and for several other reasons, not necessarily specifically how, how bugs happen, but um, just, just kind of talk a little bit, we'll spend about 10 or 15 minutes on, on things that are occurring in the industry in the, in the um, application of, of uh, mobile development that bugs and issues. So yay for apps. We have all these um, mobile operating systems. We've got, um, of course, iOS, uh, Android, Blackberry, Windows Phone, Samsung, Nevada, WebOS, Symbian. Um, you can read the table, but um, that's a lot of different things to know about, and they're all highly specialized and require a good bit of um, knowledge about each area to be proficient in. So it's <laughs> kind of what you, what you feel like when you're getting into mobile development. Um, it's kind of wild. So it means that you need to be proficient in eight programming languages. If you want to hit that whole table, uh, set eight different devices. I have, I have three. Between the three of these, it's like 1,500 bucks worth of stuff. Um, you've got to have the actual device. There's like all these platforms that have like, oh, we have a simulator, we have an emulator, and that's great. It does a lot of stuff, but it doesn't do. It doesn't cover <coughs> everything. All the scenarios that can happen on that device that, are, that a customer I guarantee will encounter, um, unless you have the physical piece of hardware. Um, and then of course you got to run the two operating systems because of our good friends at Apple. Um, how many of you know this guy, the Ninja Rockstar Mobile? Programmer guru, bro. Maybe, maybe some of you guys are this guy. I don't know. <laughs> uh, only builds, only builds for iPhone. I, ha I have an iPhone, so I, I'm ripping on iPhone because I'm an owner. Um, so yeah, I mean, like, there's all these uh, really. Uh, I think like the initial iPhone rage is kind of like a gold rush. Uh, some of the developers that are doing their own thing or working for companies have made some money in their own apps or whatever, and. And a lot of people tell like, oh, iPhone's only answer. Like, we'll build a native app on iPhone, and that'll work for everybody. But it doesn't. Um, there are, I can tell you, Ring, because we're an agency, we build lots of different mobile projects for lots of different companies. And many of those projects um, are intended to be used on iPhone, on Android, on tablets, and a number of devices. And so um, oftentimes, they don't have, like, million dollars to come and do a custom app on each one of those devices. So there has to be a solution that you can not, not necessarily write once deploy everywhere because that's like utopia I think, but but allow you to do a 
concentrated effort that, that allows a lot more portability into each specific platform. Um, so here's a good idea. Let's use HTML5. It's great for offline apps, right? Nope. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, like, like HTML5, uh, we have this capability to render um, web documents on all sorts of different devices. And you think that it would be an excellent candidate as far as layout's concerned to, to load apps, native apps, off, uh, you know, not native apps, but um, non-mobile web apps. So like I'm talking about an app that's saved on the device. So we'll get into some of those specific um, technologies in a bit. But that's a funny picture. So here's our problem with HTML, uh, specifically HTML5 on mobile devices. Um, Local storage. Uh, there's probably a half dozen different ways you can deal with that on the <coughs> device or the platform. Um, Web SQL you can use on some devices. You can use like SQL Live. You can use some things to store data. Because the real, the real paradigm you're having to address here is that these apps, if they're not a mobile website, have to store data on behalf of the user um, that's, that's on the phone. Um, Window.name is a problem. It's not. It's not available in a lot of the different um, shells that you use. Uh, file APIs. If you're saving and reading and writing files from the mobile web application, they're still being spec'd. Like you're, it's kind of like you're painting the car while you're driving it down the road. It's just. It's not fun. Um, if you've used Google Gears, it's a way to store some offline stuff. Sometimes it shows up. So that's special. Um, so I'm talking about like all the different platforms. But in, in line with this, I'm speaking about iOS, Android, BlackBerry, uh, Windows 7, Windows Mobile 7. So IE has its own thing, of course. It's all user data. Um, I hate IE in any form. And well, maybe 9 is okay, but uh, yeah, Microsoft just tends to be like, well, let's do whatever else. Blackberries have this thing, um, Blackberries kind of become an irrelevant, but anyway, but persistent storage on navigator.store. The, the wild thing with JavaScript is like anybody can add anything to anything, and uh, or they can overwrite somebody else's thing, and it just it's, it sucks. Um, then app cache, it's a douchebag and irrelevant to apps without a server anyway, so don't use app cache. Uh, it's kind of a waste of time. So, the problem is that we have like all these ways of storing data, and some of them work really well on some platforms, some of them don't. Uh, a lot of like these um, frameworks or mobile packages that we'll talk about in a little while claim to like solve all your problems, or at least they're marketed to solve all your problems, and they don't. Um, they do a lot of things really well, and I'm not saying don't use them. By abs uh, absolutely, we do. We have to, but um, but you you have to go into these that knowing that. There's no way to build a mobile application easily that will work on every single device and have zero problems. Um, there's just, you, you just have to um, accept that. Um, so here's some alternative approaches that, that need to be considered for mobile development uh, that will really help you in your development timeline and or debugging these later on, which will be the truth. Then, a good chunk of all this presentation actually showing off some of these debugging tools. But um, so PhoneGap, anybody heard of PhoneGap? It's pretty popular. Yeah, some of you. Okay. Um, kind of being open source or repackaged thanks to Adobe as uh, Apache Cordova. So if you hear that name or see it around there, you'll kind of know it's um, essentially the same thing. Um, Sentry Touch, um, JQ Touch, jQuery Mobile, Titanium. These are all kind of the Shining stars, for lack of a better term, of uh, mobile development frameworks that use um, HTML, JavaScript, CSS as sort of the base. Although Titanium is just pretty much specifically JavaScript. Um, they allow you to get really far um, on building a, a web app, uh, excuse me, a, a mobile application. Um, some of these, like JQ Touch and jQuery Mobile, Sencha even allow you to build a mobile-friendly website um, that, that users pulling up that version of your website. Um, so, like I said, 
said, these do a lot of things really, really well, but they don't solve all those problems that we mentioned before. Um, some of them solve a lot of them, but uh, if you go into any of these projects and think that like this app that you build, all you have to do is install some stuff and reskin a few pages, and that it's going to run well on every device, then um, you're making a mistake. So uh, the first date to mobile health starts with one question. Version of WebKit is this whatever expletive you want to think, insert <laughs> um, And it's true. Like sometimes if, if you if you've done any web development, anybody do non web development. I mean, excuse me, non mobile uh, HTML web development in here. Mm -hmm. Some of you. Okay. Uh, so yeah, WebKit's really popular. Um, the problem is like there's a list of all these different operating systems that that much of many of the popular uh, mobile devices run. And every single one of those has a different version of WebKit. And every single one of those has uh, a different either features or lack of features. And so you can look it up. There's a few sites that list this like massive matrix of like all these WebKit features that are or are not supported on all of these operating systems. Everything from like certain JavaScript events to like CSS and um, and uh, other HTML5 rendering things. Like there's tons of quirks. There's probably between all these, there's probably, I don't know, this matrix has probably like 30 columns and 200 rows. It's crazy. Um, so anyway, not to really scare anybody, but just you kind of have to understand that, that this really is a wild west. So um, most of the most of the, the way that a lot of people go about um, building a mobile application, a mobile website that uses JavaScript, is they'll put this command in. Um, so you can, this just basically does like a alert, not alert, but a console output when your JavaScript made it there. Um, so I kind of feel like this kid it makes it there. Um, the problem with this is, let's say, if you're doing PhoneGap, you have to build up this application and you run it either, you run it in Xcode or the Android development environment, Android SDK. Um, if you're deploying to a real device from the time that you have built to when you can actually interact with the device, that's usually around like a minute to two minutes, depending on how far in you want to see this console log. So it's really, really inefficient to debug this way. Um, like what I mean by debug would be like, I want to see that this <coughs> JavaScript function is called when the device loads up. Like in PhoneGap, it provides you a way to know if where the user is, uh, as far as geolocation API, or um, uh, what type of connection the device has. And so sometimes the only way to find those out unless you're debugging is to put a console.log in there. And so um, when you get in that event, you see it output on your debugger <coughs> panel on your machine or on the device, and uh, um, it works. But um, I can guarantee you, if, if this is all you're doing, or once you get into a mobile app, um, it's going to waste tons and tons of hours. You're going to waste hours and hours and hours just putting console logs, running the app, seeing if that works, know that didn't work, make a little change, build, see if that works. Um, it just, it's incredibly inefficient. So not only is it frustrating for the developer, it's frustrating to whoever's paying for your project, whether that's you or, or a company or your um, client or whatever. It's going to burn time and it's going to cost money at some level. And so um, there's absolutely a better way and that's Um, so, we need to be serious about um, production, and what I mean by production is the product that's going on to a mobile device, the product that's going on to a server that's going to be dis displayed um, as a website. So, this is really the first step um, to avoid bugs in the first place, so you don't have to waste this round trip time of console logging and tracing down bugs, is to try to weed out as many as you can in the first place. Um, so there's these really cool tools, uh, or pre-processing tools, um, if you've ever done Node Development, Node.js, um, or others, there's a really good, great tool called Less, um, essentially can pre-process your CSS and some of your markup to make it, uh, basically you're, you're using um, some more simple code to, to generate clean and elegant and well-organized and kind of guaranteed to be correct. <laughs> CSS and markup that the browser or mobile browser ends up loading. 
um, you can compile your, your templates, like HTML templates, in the, uh, beforehand. So you're, you're running these events on like a build server, or like you, you can make an AND script or some local script that, that does these things for you. Um, JSLint, this is a really cool tool I'll show you in a second. Um, anybody heard of JSLint or JSLint? So um, JSLint is, uh, uh, there's a really excellent book if you're in, new to JavaScript development called JavaScript, The Good Parts by Douglas Crawford. Um, he created this tool called JSHint that is really good. Um, the problem is that it forces you to sort of um, do things his own way and he has some weird ideas about certain things. So the JSLint project, I think, is my opinion, is a little bit better. It's forked from his and, and it gives you some more options. That's reverse. JSLint is Crawford, JSHint is. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. That's what I meant. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'll show you the website, um, and uh, you can install each of these with the JS project pretty easily. Um, then you've got uh, some other tools here, Concat, Minify. Minify is allowed, uh, there's two different ones, Minify, uh, well, excuse me. You can minify your JavaScript or CSS, um, and in order to minify it, it has to be correct. Um, also, if you're building a mobile, uh, like a PhoneGap project, for example, um, is a really good idea to just in, have one index.html, and at the bottom of that is one script to include that includes <coughs> everything. Um, it's kind of, it, it just will help you. I can't, I, I could spend you know, 15 minutes explaining why, but you, uh, it's just a good way to go. Um, then, of course, run unit tests. There's some excellent JavaScript um, unit test frameworks out there, Jasmine and some others, to if, you've not, if you're not familiar with unit testing or have not been in other languages, um, just read about it. Um, it. It will really save your bacon. Um, the problem is that you have to really start a, a unit testing on a project from the outset or it becomes extremely difficult to implement them later. Um, so, oh, go ahead. Um, oh, I guess you're just getting into that. I was going to ask what, what libraries do you recommend? Like, I found because you've got so much asynchronous stuff going on in JavaScript, mm -hmm. it seems like most of the testing suites I've used, they don't cater to that well. Yeah, it, it can be tough. Like, um, that's a, uh, probably the hardest thing that you, you have to deal with in JavaScript in general is just the asynchronous ex execution. But one thing I really like about PhantomJS, I don't know if you used it, it's, it's sort of like a headless browser, so you can, um, you can fire off all of your JavaScript events and check uh, do some introspection on um, on the DOM, on CSS things that it's created. So you can you can completely load up and render your mobile project in memory and ask it about how it's loaded, fire off events, use Jasmine to check the expected results of those events. And so at like this is these PhantomJS specifically and Jasmine, just with a single command allow you to like check anything about how the project is rendered or what what the JavaScript um, is doing, uh, call functions, and, and check the intended results of things. And so, um, so that's what I would suggest. There's a, so the Wrestler is a really good um, um, tool. Within, I think you have to use it with Node, but but uh, it allows you to do um, API calls and REST calls um, with, with that library. So, Random JS site is pretty good. They have some good. Um, anybody here in here heard of a project called Jenkins? Yeah, great. Many of you. Um, excellent, excellent tool. Uh, highly recommend it. Jenkins out of the box, well, not out of the box, but they have a slew of um, kind of crowdsourced or user contributed extensions, two of which are tools to build uh, an iOS project, an Android project. Um, granted, if you're building iOS, you have to be on, a, or at least have a slave environment that's running on a Mac, but um, you can kick off a mobile build or a mobile web build, run any of these tools like PhantomJS, uh, JSHint, um, it uses Jasmine, any of those things. They take a lot of, not, I would say, medium amount of work to, um, to define your, your unit tests and, and get things scripted and, and set up properly. But once you do, um, you can just dump like your Android package or iPhone executable onto some shared server <coughs> or there's tools out there like um, Hockey and some others that allows you to do team development with um, mobile projects. And so 
you can go from committing your source code to having the application running on six people's devices in just a few minutes if you're, if you're using Jenkins properly. Um, okay, let's go into just a little demo about JS Hint. So uh, I have Node installed. You can download it from um, Node.js website. They have builds for, for uh, Mac and PC. Um, yeah. Hopefully this works. Just going to go. Uh, NPM is the Node Package Manager tool. You can just, um, you just I don't need to install it. Probably. So now um, I have. Once you install Node, Node comes with this um, NPM package manager. So this command that I've run here, um, all it's doing is uh, all it's doing is um, installing the JS hint package, and that dash g just says to install it globally, meaning it's available for for every user. So now we should have JS hint tool. So let's uh, yeah, close your eyes and then you go. Actually, this is really bad. Yeah, let's make, let's, just, let's, just not there. Uh, let's make a JavaScript. You guys are familiar with the auto semicolon insertion of JavaScript? Anybody? Oh, okay. um, so let's. We have this JavaScript file. Uh, <laughs> um, so let's see if this works here. Uh, this is the, uh, so that's pretty basic, right? We're just um, we're printing out, we're calling this function imam and uh, printing out a which is being set to 1 plus 2 to be basic, right? Um, so let's Same thing here, right? Well, what happens if we were to do um, something like this? Anybody know what's going to happen here? Return on defined. Good. Wait. <laughs> we have this really awesome bug that exists in JavaScript because of the auto semicolon insertion <coughs> that um, if it ever encounters a return statement, uh, most Interpreters, anyway, are going to just return right there. They don't look for any white space after return or a semicolon or anything. It just it encounters return, so it returns. It doesn't ever get to this line, to line uh, six, five. So that's a special problem that uh, would require some really 
eagle eyes to, no, to notice in a really big project. Either you've got like some, well, how do you prevent something like this? This is just like uh, a potential problem, um, but it could be a really big problem if it wasn't handled or caught. So that's where um, JS hint comes into play and it's really useful. I can say JS hint demo JS. Let's see what it says about it. Oh, it says there's a line breaking error return line four column five. Let's make a semicolon. Um, so it's detected that problem and warned us about it. Um, it also has given us a nice return value of one, which if you're using an automated build environment like Jenkins or something that it can halt, it will it'll fail to build if that um, JS hint um, exits with that exit code. So all you have to do is go back here and fix it. So JSON is really, really useful to do some um, analysis of your code and um, tell you about problems in the first place, specifically for JavaScript. Uh, they also have a really cool They have a cool website, um, really simple. You can just paste some JavaScript code in here and test it. So back to our example. So if, this, if you just want to test some code to see if it runs. The nice thing with JS Hint is uh, it has all these options. And you can make a config file for your project that has some of these on or off, or extend and make your own rules that um, look for certain things. Maybe you have some um, specific like um, coding style that you want to enforce, or um, some rules you can, you can extend it um, on your own, and it works just fine. Um, if anybody's using like uh, version like uh, tools like um, Subversion or Git, um, a lot of them have hooks that you can tell it to run commands like this before code is, is pushed or committed. Um, so it, it would prevent like bad code from even getting in there in the first place and, and attempted to be built. So um, just a Specifically, nice one's called pre-commit. Mm -hmm. It's a, a Ruby tool. Cool. I just found out about it the other day. And also there's a JS hint plugin for them. Oh, and Emacs and so every time text it just runs it or gives it a little warning at the bottom. Yeah, there's like a, a three line install for Syntastic, and if it d detects the binary JS hint, then anytime there's a .js file, it runs it on it. Nice. It's way, cool. it's it's been way cool. Yeah. Yeah. So JS hint is awesome, and I would highly suggest if you're doing any JavaScript development. Um, so uh, next, I'd like to demo a tool called. Ripple, it's, it was actually initially built by this company called Tiny Hippos, which BlackBerry um, acquired last year at some point. Um, but it's a, a tool that's available in the Chrome App Store. So if you're a Chrome fan like me, um, you can go to the Chrome <coughs> App Store and just search for Ripple and you'll find it. It's a plugin. So once you install it, you get this little Ripple icon up here by your toolbar. Um, so our good friends over at um, Sencha, they have some. Um, examples which you can download. Um, I've downloaded the Central Library. I could probably pull this up on their website. Um, but this is just some demos uh, of, of using the Sencha Touch framework. Well, let's say I wanted to like simulate this in a mobile environment somehow. Um, you know, I, think I see a lot of people doing something like this. Um, they'll set like some browser preferences. Yep, that's my iPhone. <laughs> um, kind of works, I guess. But um, but uh, Ripple's pretty amazing. So let's go ahead and run it. It says, uh, do you want to enable it for this site? Yes, we do. And it says, well, what do you want to simulate? Are we simulating a PhotoGap project? Uh, WebWorks, so this is BlackBerry compliant, so they're trying to steer use WebWorks. Or let's just say, well, let's, I think it's just a... Uh, um, Let's just say it's mobile web, so this would be like just a website. So now we have it actually wrapped in a in a window, just kind of a generic window. But this is cool, ready, ready for the magic wand. Um, 
let's say, oh, we want it to mirror the screen size of an iPhone. Okay, done. Um, let's say we wanted to look, see what it looks like on an iPhone as landscape. Okay. And, you know, we've got scrolling here, which is nice. You can click on stuff and see what it does. Uh, I don't want to over tout Ripple. It's pretty buggy. Um, you have to refresh the page a lot and they do some shifty stuff to, like, simulate uh, a mobile environment. But uh, it works reasonably well for, for most things. Um, you, for a mobile web, don't, don't get into too much of this, but uh, for just kind of basic UI testing, it seems to work reasonably well. Of course, you still have the um, inspect element, so the, you know, the, the, um, the WebKit inspector and the debugger that you're used to uh, you're, you're using from. So it gets in the way a little bit because this Ripple UI stuff is all HTML, so you have to go dig in a little bit sometimes, but you know, script debugging and all this stuff is absolutely possible and, uh, and it works really well um, for just kind of basic HTML environment simulation. You got iPad, uh, keep in mind it's just the iPad 2, 1 and 2, it doesn't do the, my screen can't even simulate the iPad 3 screen size, so. I have um, a question for Tom Preece. Oh, excuse me, go ahead. Does this do anything with like touch events or, or is it just the size? Um, no, it does, it does simulate the touch events. Um, let me find the demo here. Uh, so they, they have like some wrappers that, that <laughs> that allow the, the application to respond to the touch events and you can, uh, you can trap a read. So you can see like I'm clicking here but it's calling the touch start and touch end events that it's actually the thing. So it's simulating it, but it's calling the same um, JavaScript API part uh, things that Sentia provides. Okay. So Ripple is basically trapping those and routing it to the mouse click event, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, so let me also pull up. jQuery mobile um, pages. So this is their site, right? But um, let's see what this looks like on a simulated iPhone screen, maybe. Maybe. Let's go with Mobile App just for fun. See, here's what I mean. It's you know, stuff and you just have to refresh it. Uh, and let's go ahead and send it to our new show off some cool stuff. That you notice when I did PhoneGap, it comes up with this accelerometer thing, which allows you to simulate um, device acceleration. What do I have? Well, anyway, you may just have to take my word for it. If you're testing it, if you're if you're if you're on a page that 
um, is listening to the, the normal HTML5 way or whatever jQuery or Sencha or But this little thing, you just grab it and move around through your mouse, and it will it will send the accelerometer um, events. It will, of course, it's simulated to your um, whatever you have loaded in here, and so you can simulate, you know, turning it upside down, or you know, it, it really works. I've got it working. Um, also, you've got geolocation. You can mine this in by some folks in Canada, so it calls for like some place Waterloo, Canada. But but you can. You can zoom this out and uh, drop it in Utah. And if your if your app is responding to geolocation, it will just take those coordinates. Um, you got with the phone gap. You got you can set whether this is Wi-Fi or 2G, 3G, 4G, or Ethernet. And with phone gap, it will fire those things or, or set that um, variable in the application so you can know what environment. So this is really, really useful. It, it does a lot of stuff. It's certainly not the device. It's not the end all be all for all of your testing, but it allows you to get a long ways with just stuff in your browser. Um, and oh, I was going to show you, you've got these events you can fire as well. On device ready, back button, press, menu button, pause, resume. So these are like hardware buttons that exist on an Android device, and you can simulate those JavaScript events by selecting the one you want to hit fire. So that's really cool. I like Ripple a lot. Again, um, it's kind of a little bit unstable and kind of buggy at times, but it works pretty well. Um, Adobe Shadow, this is cool. This is where you can actually see some stuff on the device. Uh, one of the, sometimes you run into just UI or display, display problems on the device. hard to figure out what, what's causing them. I don't have any demo of a display problem, but... Um, so what you do is uh, you, you can just Google for Adobe Shadow. It's a plugin, um, or rather it's a piece of software that runs on your machine. You also have to install, if you want to do it this way, the Google Chrome Shadow plugin, which is right here. And uh, I've got it turned on. And it's waiting for a connection. Um, so it's listening on the network. You also go and you pick up a, a shadow app in that respective app store for your device. So you've got it on the um, Apple Store, Apple App Store, and, uh, and the Google Play Store. And um, Well, uh, so they have to download Shadow. They're not, you're not going to be able to run the app. Um, I think you might be talking about it, Adobe Air. Air. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Shadow is just mostly for testing, but, but Air would be um, would be a, a way to run like a flex project um, in an app shell. So I put in my, uh, I ran a shadow program on this iPad and I put in my system's IP address here <coughs> just to, to do some linking. It's asking for the passcode, so we put it in here as well. And then um, this iPad is now paired with, with my machine over the wireless network. So now if I go over here to shadow, So now it's pulled up Google, but then I can go and let's say, let's go to reviews homepage. Um, and should, oh, sorry. So now 
now I've got UV's homepage on the iPad. Uh, and now I can go to Elements here and just mouse over these. And you can see like the DOM is highlighted and you've got some stuff. And now, ready for the real magic wand, I'm going to bust open the console and I can say, So you can you can do anything on a console here. You unfortunately can't do JavaScript actual breakpoint debugging in this tool, uh, which is a, uh, it's just kind of downer. But you can do any stuff on the, the JavaScript console here to, to see what's going on in the DOM when JavaScript variables are set to uh, set CSS properties, and it's really handy because you've got your mouse and your keyboard and you can um, do it fast and, and it manipulates the the elements on this device. I can do the same demo on here and on here. There's, like I said, um, this is a Galaxy tab and, uh, on Android, and um, it works on all three of these devices. <coughs> so that can get you a long ways to figuring out um, problems that are occurring on the physical device in the, the rendering environment. Again, you have to run it in an app. You can't just run it in the Safari browser or Android browser, Firefox, or whatever your whatever browser you're running. But keep in mind that the shadow, see on uh, oh, I'm not sure what I'm right, the shadow is an app on here. So I load shadow and it's pulling up the shadow app. But that's just a, a shell for the Safari browser. It's just it's just WebKit that you're used to on the iPad. And I, I, they're using some form of WebKit on the on the Android <coughs> devices, but I don't know how it compares with the native browser. So, um, a problem that I've noticed with the development is different browsers on the devices behave differently. So if you pick up a Zoom and you run Firefox on it versus Dolphin versus Android browser versus Chrome, they're all different. And some of them have problems like if you run out of memory, say you're using all five megabytes of memory, um, then the browser just crashes. Or like it's been really, really, really difficult to get debug messages to be able to figure out like where a problem is, to be able to get that debug message from something actually running on the device to somewhere else. Mm -hmm. The only thing I know of <coughs> is if you have the Android developer kit, there's there's a way that you can watch console.log appear on that. Right. Um, do you have any advice there or? Yeah, um, so the, I think you're, you're, you're Kind of trapping the exception or something that's have, that the OS is handing to the application, like if you're using PhoneGap or something, and sort of bubbling that up as a console.log event. Is that, is that what you're talking about? Well, I haven't actually done it, but just is there is there some way to get debug information from the device while it's running the application? to the computer where you can actually make, or, or, or even, because, um, like, say, for example, if Safari crashes, um, mobile Safari crashes because you, you run out of memory because you, you have too many JavaScript objects or you've got too much stuff on the canvas or whatever, right? Right. Uh, well, how do you figure out at what point it, it crashed? Because you can't console.log because either it, it won't show up because Android doesn't have a way to show it, right. or on iPhone, well, you can't see it anyway because if the browser closes, then you lose the log. Yeah, it can be difficult. I think that's the, the rub of uh, where you know you, you have to put on your Safari, not Safari, the browser, but just you know, go deep diving into crazy stuff. And uh, I don't have any good answers. I, there is a way we've done it to do console.log coming out in the, the Android, the, the log cat in or whatever uh, your Android development environment is. And uh, so there is a way to, to see those um, console log statements as they're occurring on the device in your IDE. Um, but I don't have any like um, solve all the problem solutions for you. Um, so does this sh shadow allow you to see JavaScript messages? Like if I were to do console.log, would it? Yes. 
So, but it will show up on this side. Right. Okay. So I don't have any examples that um, any event on here would, would cause a console log, but absolutely it would show up uh, if, I, if I were to fire one in uh, Show up in that, that uh, WebKit window, this one that comes up just right here in the console. <laughs> you can see them, errors, warnings, logs as they happen right there. So, is that just using a web UI view? On iOS, it is, yes. Okay, so um, I, if I understand correctly, there's, there's different constraints between mobile Safari if you if you open it up as mobile Safari versus if you open it up as a desktop yeah. HTML5 app versus if it opens in a web view? Yeah, Do you know about that stuff? Yeah, so, I, well, the major one I know of is that Apple won't admit it, but there's like, they have a, like a bottleneck so that this web UI view is gonna perform worse than the native Safari browser. Um, I don't have any metrics on it, but it, it definitely does, you've seen it. Yeah, there's just there's there's that and probably half a dozen other little quirks that are kind of frustrating. So if you're building a mobile website, um, that can be a challenge. Um, and you know, if you're relevant to those challenges, you're probably pushing the envelope of of a mobile website anyway. But um, I don't have any good answers there other than just kind of be aware of what causes problems and avoid them. Um, so I got a. Here, uh, this one's cool. Um, it's called iWeb Inspector, and uh, it's a little tool. It installs. I think it's only for OS 10 or Mac. You on Windows? Sorry. Um, you also have to have the Xcode um, software installed with the iOS, the, the mobile. What they call the the iPhone SDK, iOS SDK. Um, which will give you the iOS simulator. So you have to be an iPhone developer or have access to a developer account to use this tool, at least what I'm going to show you. So I have the simulator running over here. Um, and let me set this address to the right one. up from a web server here, um, this kitchen sink demo Sencha application from a web server just running on this laptop. Nothing fancy here, just if you've ever used the iOS simulator, just, just running Safari here. Um, so what you do is you uh, open this iWeb inspector and uh, if you click this load from Safari, once you have the So it's just grabbing the URL somehow. I don't know exactly how this thing functions, but it's grabbing the, the address that you're that you're using here, and you just click this, and then it pulls it up. Um, so this is similar to the tool I just showed you in that uh, you can do your inspection by by rolling over, but it does something that the other one does not, which is you can set breakpoints. So. Um, Let's say I wanted to get another touch of this here. Thank you. 
this is real debugging, right? Um, you, can, you can step through this and figure out what the heck is going on. So the problem is that we're not running this on a real device, and this is a true simulator that it does its best. It does a pretty good job, reasonable job of simulating local Safari, but I guarantee if you get into a reasonably complicated application, you'll see things that your application works by there, and then you put it on here, and it sucks. Um, so I don't know what to tell you there other than um, you know you can get 95% of the way with debugging with this tool, but um, but you're going to run into problems that are only happening on the app, and that's where it just gets kind of wild. But uh, this is a really really cool tool for um, doing debugging on the device. Then there's this, I, I, I spent probably almost all of today before trying to get this one working. I, I've read that people have had success, <coughs> but I can't personally vouch for it. Um, what it requires is you actually have to deploy a patched version of the Firefox browser to an Android device. Um, and then you can link your Android device to your machine um, with a USB cable. And then use the Android debugger, the ADB tool, um, so if you're developing in Eclipse, for example, that uh, you can you can set your breakpoints. It, it it also comes with a a piece of software to do the actual negotiation of the breakpoints and things. Um, but it allows you to do real debugging with breakpoints and other things on the piece of hardware with a Firefox browser um, on Android. But again, I, I unfortunately couldn't get it running, so I don't have anything exciting to show you there. Um, so I I found Firefox to be the least favorable of the browsers. Yeah, it's, Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, it's kind of kind of crummy. It's not what you come to expect from the desktop, unfortunately. Because they're they're still trying to port Gecko over instead of using WebKit and the mobile, right. right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I I feel like that um, the browsers on Android have some room for improvement. I know there's there's some exciting developments with project that's going to run on like newer, newer versions of Android, so you might want to kind of follow those ones, but like, that's the really frustrating thing with Android is that you've got these 10 different devices and each device people might, may or may not be running um, the same browser and uh, it, gets, it gets kind of crazy. So um, the good news is if you're building a native application, say uh, a PhoneGap project, for example, So that's kind of all I had to cover, uh, but I'd like to use the last five minutes to if anyone else has any questions. I wanted to know more. You mentioned PhantomJS. Mm -hmm. like, how do you hook it up to like Jasmine? And it seems like Selenium should uh, use some, if you have Selenium, it should use some more, but like Phantom could be like a quick sanity check before you check in or something like that. Right, I think like um, as far as setting it up and, and getting it running, it's probably outside the scope and certainly what we have time to, to cover. But um, I'd encourage you to look at their website. They have some really good documentation and source code examples. As far as comparing with Selenium, uh, they both, in my mind, do very similar things. Selenium is, is, is great because uh, it allows you to simulate you know, sort of what the user activity is going to be on the web application. Um, and, and you can kind of see and, and understand what the expected results are going to be. Um, so I would say PhantomJS does essentially the same thing. You just don't have a, a physical browser window or a user environment to run those tests in. Um, you're, still, you're still being required to script some activity or tell it what to click on or what to look at or what to test or what to, to see to see if something ran it correctly or whatever. Um, it's just you're not dealing with it as a browser plugin. It's just, it's like a headless browser. You can think of it as it's it's just that browser that you can have command line access to and you can have to reach your hand through this box and manipulate and, and check stuff. So um, yeah, like you can look at the documentation and um, 
There's another project out there, um, Casper, we're going to say Casper GS. Yes. Um, I don't know. I, I have actually haven't used Casper. I've just heard that it works with um, Phantom to, to do some, some better stuff. Any other questions?